And thank you all for inviting me. This is a very special occasion. I'm delighted to see some old Princetonians in the audience and, uh, and a few old friends. So it's uh, wonderful to be here. I have not visited this university before, so this has been a, a, a great day. Uh, my voice is suffering for having uh, spoken too much and listened too little, I think. So I wanted to show you what spring is like. Uh, the spring. <laughs> Now, you'd be happy to know it hasn't arrived there either, but when it does arrive, we'll all enjoy it. And uh, these are the tulips in the garden uh, behind Prospect at, uh, at, at Princeton. Let me begin by <clears throat> saying that, of course, what I'm telling you about and what I will be telling you about was all uh, done by my graduate students and various different uh, collaborators. Uh, particularly, I'm going to talk about work that James Michael did, who is now uh, just joining the faculty at Iowa State University, and Manny Stockman, who's at Lockheed. Uh, but many of the other students here have made major contributions, uh, and I hope to recognize them if I don't forget uh, during the talk. <clears throat> I also wanted to recognize support from John Schmisher, who's now stepped down uh, from AFOSR and is down at the University of Tennessee Space Institute. Julian Tishkoff, who's also now emeritus, I guess, or retired anyway from the AFOSR and Chi Ping Lee. And the student support is from various uh, 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 fellowships as well as from the AFOSR and uh, uh, and we appreciate that very much. Okay, so what are we trying to accomplish? Well, a variety of things. Uh, we're looking at efficient control of atmospheric or higher pressure combustion. There's been a lot of work uh, in the field on very low pressure combustion, but of course, as most of you know, uh, combustion of interest typically occurs at atmospheric pressure or higher. Uh, and uh, in particular, we're looking at methods of extending the lean limit, uh, doing volumetric ignition, flame speed enhancement, reduction in oxides of nitrogen, uh, and acoustic control, generating acoustics and uh, using those to control mixing and other things. And then I'll end by talking a bit on control of high-speed flows uh, and separation mixing, drag reduction and steering, uh, before I talk finally about uh, a new uh, diagnostic that I'm very excited about called femtosecond laser electronic excitation tagging, or FLEET. Okay, so how are we accomplishing these goals? <clears throat> And I'll, I'll talk more about this as we get into, the, into this uh, uh, presentation. Uh, the, for the combustion, we have laser-guided microwave ignition. Uh, this is sort of an augmentation to laser ignition. There's been a lot of work in this field in uh, using lasers to ignite. Uh, with microwaves, we can do some volumetric things, and I'll show you some of that. And then microwave coupling to the flame zone. This allows us to increase the flame speed. And some of you saw the little pictures that were uh, in the flyer that was sent out uh, showing some of that work. And then we're going in and looking at pulse microwaves, uh, and this allows us to get to much higher efficiency. Uh, and we've used those to reduce the lean limit, uh, increase the flame speed uh, using higher efficiency processes, and then also for sound generation. Uh, for airflows, we're looking at various approaches. Uh, dielectric barrier discharges are surface uh, on the surface. Uh, provide an opportunity to do surface control, uh, some uh, separation uh, control, uh, magnetohydrodynamic driven uh, surface plasmas for separation control, and then finally some work on uh, trying to understand how we can reduce the drag in very high speed vehicles by adding energy in front of the vehicle. How are we doing this? Well, many of these technologies are ones that you're all familiar with. Uh, Schlieren uh, dates back from uh, hundreds of years, or 100 years anyway. Uh, we'll use that to look at some of the dynamics of ignition. Uh, that we do with a very short pulse laser so we can capture the time domain. Particle imaging velocimetry, I must say I'm very impressed with the work that's going on here in particle imaging velocimetry in, in high-speed flows. Uh, Laser-induced fluorescence imaging, uh, these are technologies which were first developed uh, at Princeton. This we developed back in the 1970s and then was picked up by others, including Ron Hansen, uh, and applied to, uh, uh, to combustion. Filtered Rayleigh scattering, I'll talk more about that. I'm not going to talk too much about this because I think it's, a, it's an old technology, but I'll talk more about filtered Rayleigh scattering. Uh, radar Rampy, which we use for measuring nitric oxide, and then as I mentioned, this uh, uh, femtosecond laser electronic excitation tagging. <clears throat> I just wanted to, to highlight some of the uh, trade-offs associated with uh, short pulses, okay, because the uh, title of this talk was uh, essentially micro, nano, femto. And uh, so I wanted to mention that uh, if we look at time, uh, one of the things that we're interested in is capturing things uh, fast enough to be able to understand how they evolve. 
And so typical combustion times are basically on the order of 10 to the minus 4 seconds. Now, some of the turbulent hypersonic combustion things happen much faster than that. But I can capture much of this in microseconds. So this is my micro. Uh, the typical fluid dynamic uh, times are typically longer than about a microsecond. So we can capture those in nanoseconds. Molecular collisions occur in about a tenth of a nanosecond. This is at atmospheric uh, pressure. And we can capture that in picoseconds. And then the vibrational lifetimes of these uh, molecules typically are in the order of femtoseconds. So we have sort of this range of potential for capturing dynamic processes. And capturing dynamic processes allows us to look at time evolution and understand more details about what physics are involved. But there's another trade-off here which is interesting, and that's this frequency bandwidth one. And this basically gets to the uncertainty principle, uh, which tells us that there is a, uh, a relationship between energy and time. And that means that my uncertainty in the measurement of energy is related to the amount of time I take to measure them. And this is just another one of the expressions of the classic uncertainty principle that Heisenberg put together. And it says that the uncertainty in energy times the uncertainty in time is equal to h bar over 2. Now, many of you may remember that the energy of light is h bar times the frequency. So we can simply write this in terms of the frequency. And this is a radial frequency. And it says the radial frequency times the time is equal to 1 half. So it gives you an, an interesting uh, uh, reference. It says if I have a very short pulse laser, it is by definition pretty broad bandwidth. So if I want to do very accurate spectroscopy, I need to have a very narrow bandwidth laser. So therefore, I need something which is long time, long pulse, continuous wave. Uh, and uh, so this is, this is one of the uh, considerations that we have to use when we decide how to proceed and what laser systems would be appropriate. The other thing which is important is to remember intensity. Now, as you heard in the introduction, I've done work in linear and nonlinear optics. Nonlinear optics occurs when I have high intensity, and so the, uh, the electric field is interacting with the atom or molecule in a nonlinear fashion. So that means if I increase the intensity by a factor of 2 for uh, second order processes, I end up with the interaction increasing by a factor of 4. Well, that's very interesting because many processes we're interested in looking at are highlighted by nonlinear interactions. And uh, the, the thing that happens here is that if I start to get to short pulses, I can get much higher intensities. Because remember, the intensity is related to the energy divided by the time. So if I have a constant energy, say, for example, 1 millijoule, if I have a time which is on the order of femtoseconds, you see I have 10 to the 13th uh, watts. So I have tremendous amount of energy that I can, uh, energy I, uh, intensity I can get with very short pulses. So that's one of the things that drives us to use short pulses for some of these uh, applications. OK, so now I wanted to talk a bit about uh, how we're going to proceed. Uh, for the microsecond uh, area, I want to use pulse micro microwaves. And these are typically in the 1 to 3 microsecond regime. Now, you may say, well, why use pulse microwaves when we can use continuous ones? We'll see that we can much more efficiently couple them uh, into flames and, and use them for ignition processes. But the other thing which is useful is to remember that microwaves are not very well absorbed by flames. Uh, and if I just pass a microwave through the flame, I use that microwave uh, only a very small portion, and it goes off into Never Never Land. And so I'd like to do this inside a microwave cavity. That's basically what your microwave oven is. It's a microwave cavity. It allows the microwaves to resonate back and forth, sort of like singing in the shower. Uh, and so we usually describe that in terms of a quality factor, or Q. So what is the Q? The Q is essentially the ring down time of an oscillator. So if I hit a bell and ring the bell, and I count how long it takes, how many rings or oscillations, I can measure what the Q is. Do you have a question? No, I thought you were. OK, so uh, if this is the expression, the energy is a function of time, is just a ring down time. It's an exponential decay. And that exponential decay can be written as a time divided by some delta t, which is the characteristic time it takes to get to 1 over e of the energy. And that's related to the q. So the q is basically a dimensionless number, which is the number of radians it takes to get to 1 over e. So the higher the q, the longer the ring. So the bell that rings for a long time has a high q. Any resonator that has a high q will ring for a long time. 
I can take the Fourier transform of that and express it in terms of the spectrum. And it says that the spectrum for any high Q resonator is quite narrow. So if I want to put energy into this high Q resonator, I'm going to have to have a pretty narrow frequency. So I want to put pulsed energies in. I want to interact with flames. That means I have to have a pulse which is short compared to combustion times. And I want to have it long enough so that its, so that it's frequency is narrow enough to fit into this high Q uh, window that I can access. And that turns out to be very conveniently within this one to three microsecond regime. So we're talking about cavities which are about Q of 1,000. Uh, and it allows us then to very efficiently use the microwaves for our experiments. What about nanoseconds? Well, nanoseconds now we're using lasers. These are uh, classical 10 nanosecond lasers. Many of them I've seen around the laboratories today. Uh, they are relatively high energy. Uh, typically, a neodymium YAG laser would be a characteristic laser that you would have, solid state laser. These times are short compared to fluid dynamic and shock propagation times, they're 10 nanoseconds, so things are frozen typically in that time. I can put a lot of pulse energy in. Typically, I can put in even up to joules in a single pulse, so that's enough to ignite things or to do some interesting uh, in interactions with, uh, with gases. Um, and so I can use it to make sparks for ignition. We'll talk about that. And then, of course, because it's still 10 nanoseconds, it's relatively narrow line width. And I can injection lock these lasers, which means I can really make them very narrow line width. Uh, uh, and that is what we call transform limited. It means that the line width is just the inverse of this period of time, this 10 nanoseconds. And so that means I have quite a narrow line width here. And I can use it for high resolution spectroscopy, relatively high resolution, not, not huge. but Nonetheless, I can use it then in, in, con in conjunction with sharp cutoff and notch filters. And that lets, lets us use it for this new technology called filtered Rayleigh scattering. So we'll talk about that. OK, so we come to picoseconds. Picoseconds now are the, the laser system we have is about 100 picoseconds. So it's 10th of a nanosecond. So this is on the order of the collision and quenching times. And so we can freeze things which are, which are happening in these combusting environments. Uh, but the short, short pulse allows us to get the high intensity with modest energies, so we can use this for nonlinear processes. But we can also, because it's relatively narrow line width, we can tune it to a particular molecule. So I can tune it to nitric oxide, or I can tune it to carbon monoxide, or whatever molecule I want to look at, because the inverse of this time is narrow enough to allow me to tune onto the spectrum. It pretty well matches the thermal broadening of the, those molecules in uh, gases uh, at atmospheric pressure. And so we can use it then, and I'll show you how we can detect trace species with it, in particular nitric oxide. And then finally, femtoseconds. Now, these, are, these are created with what's called chirp pulsed amplified tie sapphire laser systems. They range our particular system. Uh, we have one that's at 50 femtoseconds, and another one that's about 120. So why would we want to do this? Well, now this actually freezes molecular vibration, so I can actually look at the uh, interaction of molecules in ways which I could not do with longer pulses. They're short compared to collision and quenching time, so again, I can freeze out that, uh, uh, those phenomena. But the main thing is that they're high intensity with relatively small amount of energy. So now I can do high order nonlinear actions. I can do a nonlinear action, which is 10 photon nonlinear non interaction. Uh, it's short enough so that I can actually make tracks in air before the air makes a spark. Because it takes a while for an air to spark. You have to accelerate electrons. It's an avalanche process. All this happens in times which are very fast compared to that. OK. Uh, so now let me talk a bit about uh, microwave coupling. And uh, so this is the setup. This is a picture of it, which is not terribly clear. But this little box is our microwave resonator. This is our microwave oven. Uh, and we, we send the microwave. Now, we do two sets of experiments. One is with a continuous microwave at about one, a little bit more than one kilowatt. So that's very similar to the microwave oven that you would have in your kitchen, or most of us do. Uh, we have a sliding short here, which allows us to set up this high Q resonator between the sliding short. And this is a three stub tuner, which matches the impedance. So I end up getting a high field inside here. Uh, and a relatively low microwave field coming in. So this basically builds its energy up, resonating back and forth inside this high Q resonator cavity. 
Uh, and I can measure the backward, uh, the, the energy which comes back out of that cavity. And so if I, if I start to absorb some of that microwave energy, the amount of energy I get reflected back drops down. So I can use this as a measure of the reflected energy and how much is absorbed inside. OK, so that's our microwave resonator. Now let me st show you some work we've done with uh, ignition. OK, so for this, this is intended to show you what the microwave field looks like. So there's some of these high peaked. And we, we generate the, the, these things such that the peak of the microwave overlaps a region where we're, we're doing the experiment. And then we uh, illuminate it with lasers. So this is a frequency double YAG laser, a green laser, for those of you that may not be familiar with this. Uh, and we just send it through, and we take a picture using a camera and looking at uh, this frosted glass. And we fire another laser. So there are two lasers, one which we use to do the, sh to the Schlieren, and another one that we use to ignite. Uh, this is the timing. So we, we ignite with a, with a nanosecond laser spark. And this is about a third of a microsecond before we fire the um, microwave uh, pulsar. And I can fire this pulsar at one millisecond intervals. Okay? So I fire it here. And if I do it close enough to when the nanosecond laser spark is generated, I now create a spark in the air and create ignition. OK, so that's the, that's the experiment. So I'm going to use this to ignite. And then I'm going to put energy into the flame kernel uh, as this ignition uh, proceeds. OK, so, so I hope this is clear. So these are the two different uh, experiments here. Again, this is done with uh, a mixture of methane and air. And I think that the equivalence ratio is around 0.8. So we do the ignition, and uh, what we see is a kernel which is growing as a function of time. So the ignition occurs here. About one, micro, one millisecond later, we have the, the kernel here. This is about two milliseconds. That's about the same here, and then three. Now, what happens, which is very interesting, is if I, put, if I pulse the microwave again, so I do a second pulse, what happens is that the microwave energy goes into the, to the flame front because there's a small amount of ionization that occurs in this flame front. And therefore, it heats the flame front and increases the flame propagation speed. And so we've only put in two additional pulses here. So one at about one microsecond and one at two microseconds, excuse me, one at one millisecond, one at two milliseconds. And you see that the uh, kernel has grown significantly. So we, we can create a, a, a real uh, increase in flame propagation speed using this approach. And remember, we're putting in very small amount of energy. Uh, and so this, is, uh, this shows versus the equivalence ratio uh, the increase in the flame speed based on this measurement. And so one would be uh, just what we get without that uh, microwave uh, energy addition. And we end up getting about a 25% increase in the flame speed. So this is, this is a really interesting approach because it says that I now have control of flame speed and if I can do that, I can then begin to think about applying uh, some of these combustion processes in higher speed, uh, say, for example, scramjet engines, where I can increase the flame speed and get better performance. Uh, the other thing which is interesting is that um, now I can do the same experiment, but I can turn the equivalence ratio down past the lean limit. So this is normally the lean limit for methane, which is a little bit lower, a little bit around 0.6, between 0.6 and 0.7. And as I increase the energy I put in, I can drop it. So this goes down to 0.5 if I have put in one pulse that is one microsecond in duration. Okay? If I put in a pulse with two microseconds in duration, I can decrease it to about 2.3, and three microseconds in duration, a little bit lower. So I have the opportunity now of changing the uh, combustion lean limit by a factor of two in this particular case by putting in sequential pulses uh, of differing energies. So again, that's coupling into this flame kernel and increasing the, uh, the speed, and therefore keeping the flame kernel alive uh, as, I, as it evolves. Elaine has a funny look on her face, so I don't know if I like that or not. I want to keep it going. We keep on, yeah, so we keep, we keep firing it. Yeah, we keep firing it. We fire it until, until, until it, uh, it completes the combustion. OK, so, so, it's, so it's, this, this, is, this is firing at one shot every millisecond, and each shot is one mic microsecond. Okay. And this is, this is 
Each shot is two microseconds, and again, sequential. The other thing we can do is, uh, because, because we're using uh, lasers, that we can turn the laser energy down, so we just generate a small amount of ionization, but we don't ignite, and then we can pulse the microwave, and if we bring a single laser beam in, we can get an ignition here, bring another laser beam in, we get an ignition there, so we can get multiple point ignition. So you can, of course, do that by focusing many lasers, but one of the things which is interesting is that we can now begin to think about getting ignition along a line rather than at a point, uh, and, uh, uh, and that's demonstrated here. So what we do in this case, and now I've moved to a very short pulse laser, and I'm taking advantage of that capability of the short pulse laser to write lines uh, without generating sparks. So this is uh, what we see, again using this Schlieren, with a pulse of about 120 femtosecond laser, and this is on the order of a, of a very, very small energy that's on the order of one millijoule. And you can see that I see essentially nothing, okay? So the laser is pulsed this is our time, uh, uh, so I've got two microseconds here during which the, the microwave will be turned on. So the microwave is turned on between this and this frame uh, uh, in, the lower, in the lower set of images. But up here you see essentially nothing. If you look very closely, you can see a little bit of energy addition which is created in here, but nothing very much. If I pulse the microwave, uh, now the, the laser is fired at this point and then you can see that we end up putting a lot of energy into this region. And instead of getting a spot, we end up getting a line here which echoes the focal uh, line associated with this short pulse laser. And you can see that this evolves. Now, the, the, micros, the, the microwave turns off at two microseconds, but after that, we can look at the increasing size of this because we put a lot of heat in there. And you can also see a shock wave which is propagating away from this region. So we've put heat in very quickly and we're generating essentially a cylindrical shock which is moving out uh, from this line. So this actually provides us the capability of writing various different patterns uh, and, uh, and igniting those. And here's an example of the patterns that we can write. Uh, and we didn't do ignition with this, but th uh, this, this is, uh, we have the lasers broken into four beams there's one that's down here that's horizontal, another one that's horizontal, and then two vertical beams. And it's interesting to see that we begin to get the uh, uh, microwave coupling in to these in a non-uniform way. So we, we now complete this circuit, and finally we end up with the energy which is coupled in uh, to that, that square. Now I should announce that we, we actually tried to write a P for Princeton. Uh, and, uh, and we didn't succeed. There's a little tail down here. We ended up writing an O, which I apologize for. Um, we, we probably should have written an M. So I mean. But in any case, so the thing which is very interesting is now I have a capability of writing uh, whatever kind of pattern I would like and then energizing that pattern with the microwaves. So I don't have to write a, just one single spark. I can do a volume ignition. I can do an ignition around a, a, a rectangle or whatever. Uh, whatever, uh, it's a linear, it's a bunch of linear lines because I've got lasers which are running lines. And then uh, if you look here, this, this is a measure of the temperature and it's very interesting because uh, the temperature in the, at the core of these lines uh, when activated by the microwave uh, changes uh, quite differently between nitrogen and air. So nitrogen, that temperature comes down very rapidly and what happens here is that a lot of the energy in nitrogen is stored in the vibrational mode of the nitrogen molecule. In air, because the collisional processes uh, quench that mode, that energy dumps into the translational modes very quickly, and that's what we measure here. So we see quite a difference between air and nitrogen. And actually, this causes some interesting uh, problems in some high-speed high uh, environments where the vibrational energy of nitrogen gets frozen in uh, and can change the properties of uh, high-speed fluid dynamics. So anyway, this, uh, this shows you what happens when you do combustion. So this is in a combusting region. So here, now instead of just the lines which have been activated by the microwaves, here we, we start uh, the combustion process. And again, you can see that we've generated combustion along a line. And so we basically have a volumetric combustion concept uh, where again, we can write whatever, whatever shape we want to in here and generate a combustion zone. So this again was uh, using a, a 50 millijoule two microsecond microwave pulse uh, to, uh, to initiate that combustion.
Okay, so let me now talk a minute about the uh, flame speed enhancement using uh, laminar flame. So the setup is very similar. Uh, we have a co-flow burner and we actually stabilize the flame on the top of the uh, microwave cavity. And again, this is a similar picture with the one I just showed you before. So this, this shows the flame stabilization location. We, uh, we uh, uh, can change the flow rate to uh, relocalize that. This is a stretched flame. Uh, and so the, the location is determined by essentially the local velocity. Uh, and uh, we, we have to uh, have this microwave cavity with several different apertures in it so we can see what's going on. Uh, so there's slots and windows in this. The windows are basically like to your microwave oven where there's a screen so that uh, uh, so the microwaves are still trapped within it. So this is typically done with, uh, for us, it's a methane air flame. Uh, and this shows uh, a particle imaging velocimetry uh, image taken of that, uh, uh, of that flame. So this has a long exposure so we can see the flame luminosity here. Uh, and then using particle imaging velocimetry, we can measure the velocity and, uh, from the exit. So the stretch flame speed is about 32 centimeters per second, which would be this here. And so this is the velocity of the flow coming out of the, uh, uh, of, of the uh, uh, burner. And then uh, it drops down here with the expansion of the uh, flow field. And r the flame is localized right where this line is. OK, so uh, that shows us where the flame is. And then when we turn on the microwaves, you can see that flame changes its location. Therefore, we can measure the, ch the change in the flame speed. So, Again, we have the particle imaging velocimetry, which allows us to measure the velocity. And we can see that this flame now is increasing in flame speed. Uh, now, this is with a continuous um, microwave source. So this is with nothing. This is 700 watts and 1,200 watts. So that's a lot of power. And we're only absorbing a very small amount of it here. And we're getting quite a significant uh, change in the flame speed. But it's not a very efficient process. But this just shows the change in the flame speed in this case, as a function of equivalence ratio. And it's sort of scattered around, but the maximum is around 20 to 25% change in the flame speed. Uh, we can, this is uh, with Cam Carter. We look at OH, uh, laser-induced fluorescence. And so here's what you see with the flame without the microwave on. With the microwave on, the flame position changes. Uh, and we, this, this is with flame position. Uh, when you bring these curves down, uh, you can see that with the uh, microwave on, we're getting uh, an increase in OH formation uh, and, uh, uh, and, and a longer persistence of OH downstream. So basically, we're heating, we're, we're heating the flame. Uh, so we went from there to looking at uh, the possibility of using pulses. So pulses, as I mentioned, are very uh, interesting because they can be much more efficient. Uh, and if you look at the plasma luminosity, the flame luminosity here, this is with a longer exposure. You can see this is the flame front, and this is the luminosity downstream. Uh, when we turn on the pulse, we get a bright uh, luminosity here just at the flame front. And you can see that that luminosity actually echoes the pulse almost exactly. So this is a one microsecond and a two microsecond pulse. The luminosity is uh, shown here with the, uh, 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 with the error bars. Uh, and this just shows what the pulse is. So we're getting a very rapid uh, interaction of the flame. OK, so I apologize for the sound here. It's annoying. But uh, this is the other thing which is interesting is we get an acoustic uh, sound out of this. So this shows, this is now looking through this screen grid because we have to keep the microwaves in. Uh, and that was what we see running the microwave at 1 uh, kilohertz. Now we can change the repetition of the microwaves. And of course, we're adding less energy to the, to the flame. Uh, but what you see, which is rather interesting, is the flame stays relatively constant in its location, even with relatively low microwave. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is our singing flame. Why is it going down? Because we're dropping the microwave frequency from 1,000 hertz down to 100 hertz. You're hearing, that was, this is like 100 now. It went through 10 steps. Oh, that's, that's 100. So that's 100. If you, if you can, you tune your guitar up on this, but you know, we, we should do 440. OK, so. <laughs> All right, anyway, so, so this is what we had with the continuous microwave. And this is like almost two, 2 kilowatts. 
Uh, and we get almost the same displacement here with uh, very, very much less energy. So this is two microsecond pulses, 50 millijoule per pulse. And with uh, the next slide, I'll show you the, the uh, difference. So uh, we're getting about 50 watts to get a, about a 25% uh, increase in flame speed with the pulses, whereas previously we needed on the order of kilowatts. So now we're getting much more efficient, uh, and we can we get a reduction in the amount of power that's, that is required by a factor of 26, which is the ratio of this. Uh, and the flame, by the way, is releasing something in the order of a kilowatt in power. So what we're putting in is very small compared to the flame uh, uh, energy. Well, uh, one of the things we wanted to understand then is, uh, you know, what it, what's happening? Where is this energy going in? Uh, can we take a picture? Of the, of the temperature uh, and freeze that in time. So here's the diagram. This is the stagnation surface. This is where the flame is. And of course, we want to be able to take an instantaneous picture because we're pulsing the microwave. OK, so that then led to the development uh, or the application of filtered Rayleigh scattering. So I'm going to take a little bit of time to describe what filtered Rayleigh scattering is and then come back to the application. So Rayleigh scattering, of course, is what makes the sky blue. Uh, and it's a very weak phenomenon, but with a higher energy laser, you can get quite a bit of light from it. Uh, the amount of light that you get out of it is determined by the number of molecules in the volume that you're looking at. So this is the number per unit volume times the volume, so that basically is it. This is the intensity of the laser that, you are, that you're using to eliminate. And, and then basically your collection optics, and this is the cross-section of the Rayleigh scattering for the molecules that you're looking at, so that's air. So what we do is we, we, we send a laser beam through, uh, and we look at it from the side, and we image it onto a detector. So we will actually get a picture of the Rayleigh scattering. And the Rayleigh scattering, without any filter in here, just gives us the density. So it's a very useful tool for looking at density. But the problem is that it's very weak. And so in these environments, particularly inside a resonator cavity, the background scattering that you get from the windows and walls dominates it. You can't see anything. So what we've done is we've applied this filtered Rayleigh really scattering. And what we do there is we put a, a filter that has some molecular gas or atomic gas in it, which is absorbing the light that comes from the laser. OK, so you say, well, that seems like the wrong thing to do. But let me just show you. This is uh, some images we took looking at supersonic flow. This is uh, done in our wind tunnel out at our Forestall campus. There's a wedge here. Uh, and what we've done is, in this case, we've enhanced the scattering from the flow by putting a little bit of carbon dioxide into it. Carbon dioxide, when it cools, uh, turns into these very small nanoparticles. Basically, you get crystals. And so what we're seeing here are crystals of carbon dioxide. We're seeing a shock layer. And the reason we're not seeing the walls is because we've done the following. We've tuned the laser such that it overlaps on top of an absorption line of molecular iodine. Now, the absorption line of molecular iodine has very sharp cutoff because uh, I have an optically thick cell. So this, looks like, this is the absorption line of iodine. And what happens with the flow is because of the Doppler shift, the light that scatters from the moving, uh, uh, these are nanoparticles, is shifted in frequency so that it is now coming out uh, and is not absorbed by the filter. So I can take advantage of the fact that the Doppler shift provides the capability of moving the scattering light such that it eliminates the light that's scattered from any non-moving surface, and I end up with the light that scatters from the moving molecules. So it's very useful for doing imaging. We did a lot of imaging and trying to understand turbulent boundary, shockwave boundary layer interactions and such things as that. Now, the thing which is interesting for combustion is that uh, as I go to higher temperatures in air, the Scattering that comes from just the random motion of the molecules in the air causes the light to broaden. And that broadening can be described by using modeling. This is a Rayleigh-Brion line modeling. This is, there's a Tenti model. This was done by my student, Pan. Uh, but there's well-defined, well-designed uh, uh, models. These models are interesting because at high temperature, uh, it's pretty much of a Gaussian associated with thermal motion that you would expect. At low temperature, we have acoustic sidebands. And so we have to include the acoustic side vents. You can see at atmosphere, this is room temperature, that the shape is a little bit different. And that's because of these acoustic side vents. And this y parameter is a measure of that. It's basically a Knudsen number. It's like 1 over a Knudsen number. Anyways, at very high temperatures, we get a broadening. 
So now this is the absorption uh, features associated with the iodine. If I tune the laser so that it sits right in the middle, then what happens is that the absorption of the light scattered from the cell walls and the windows is 100%, and I only absorb a portion of the light which is scattered from the molecules. So I can look at the molecules, and I can, uh, I can see them. And then, of course, the amount of light that, uh, that comes through the filter is going to be determined by the temperature. And if I assume I'm keeping constant pressure, that temperature uh, then uh, can be measured. And so I can do a calibration curve. Uh, this is a calibration curve that says, you know, how much light comes through as a function of temperature. So this is all normalized to room conditions. Uh, and once I use that calibration curve, now I can use that to measure temperature. So I can take an image, an instantaneous image, and, and get the temperature profile. And this is done in a Henkin burner. And one of the things that happens is it's very sensitive to the location of the laser relative to that filter. And so from day to day, these are all taken in different days, there's a slight variation. But nonetheless, we get within about uh, uh, something around 5%. And what's useful is that we can then take the, look, at the, look at the temperature difference with very good accuracy. So this shows what we see. Uh, the laser beam comes from the top. This is where the flame is. And this is, the, this is the air and methane mixture before combustion. After combustion, the temperature is much higher. And so that the amount of scattering is lower, but, the, but it broadens out. Uh, and if you look at the temperature increase, then this is temperature it comes, you can see the temperature is going up here, and this is when we turn the, turn the microwave on. Without that, we get this. If we transport this down to here, we can see that we have about 100 uh, K, about 90 K difference between the microwave on and the microwave off. So it gives us a very nice measure. Now that was done with the continuous, with the pulse one, though, it's very interesting because now you can see where the energy goes in. So here, here I see the high scattering from the unburned gases, which are higher density, the low scattering from the burned gases, and this region here in the reaction zone where I have now, with a pulse of a microwave, put the energy in. And you can see that I have, I have dropped this scattering, indicating that I have increased the temperature. You can invert that to the temperature, and then by just doing a difference here, you can see that the temperature increase has been between 200 and 400 Kelvin uh, for these two different pulses. One is a 25 millijoule, one microsecond, and the other is a 50 millijoule, two microsecond pulse. So it gives us an ability to time freeze uh, the, uh, the energy addition mechanism. We can also now take a look at the amount of energy that's gone into the flame because we, can, uh, we know what the uh, uh, coefficient, uh, the, uh, the uh, heat capacity is. Uh, and we can look at the energy deposited as a function of the microwave repetition rate. Uh, and then we can also look at the fraction of the energy absorbed, and we're getting something in the order of 60%. So it's turning into a very efficient way of absorbing energy uh, into, uh, into microwaves. Uh, it's interesting, if you seed the air with a little bit of sodium, you increase its uh, conductivity, and you actually get a, a more efficiency. Now, this is a, as a function of microwave repetition rate, so we're getting up to something around 70% efficiency uh, of energy addition. Okay, so one of the other things we're interested in knowing is, uh, well, okay, so we've, if we drop the lean limit, uh, you know, what happens to nitric oxide production? Are we actually uh, able to decrease the amount of nitric oxide or what happens there? And this is uh, what we've done to, uh, to, to study that is to develop this radar REMPI measurement. So REMPI is a, is a classical method of uh, a spectroscopy, resonant enhanced multi-photon ionization. And the way you do that is you tune a laser you focus it onto a, a molecule or a gas of interest. And then uh, when you tune this laser to interact with the particular absorption characteristics of that gas, and you turn the laser beam up in power, you end up ionizing that. And typically, this has been done using a, a, a local um, uh, probe. And you can measure the ionization by using that probe. What we've done is we've recognized that we can do this with, with a microwave. It's basically radar. So we put a microwave beam here, and when there's a spark there, a very weak ionization, we get an echo. Without that, we don't. Uh, and the nice thing about this is the microwaves are extremely um, sensitive. Uh, we can use very uh, high sensitivity detection technology, uh, heterodyne and homodyne uh, methods, uh, and measure very, very small amounts of ionization. The microwave de uh, device itself is very small. These are 100 gigahertz microwaves. The microwave waveguide is about three millimeters in diameter. 
or it's a, it's a rectangle, so three millimeters across. So it's a very small device, and then we can use this and just aim it where we want to, and we can, we can either use a, 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 a dual configuration where we have a microwave transmitter and a detector, or we can use the same, um, the, the same horn for detection and for transmission. Okay, so this is a diagram of how you do this. This is using the same horn. You send, you send a beam of microwaves out. It interacts with this plasma. It's polarized. This is the polarization. We get a, a scattering from the plasma. It comes back. You can separate that with what's called a circulator, amplify it. You mix it, and, and, you, and then you amplify it. And so when you mix this, this is what's called homodyne detection. Uh, you end up getting a signal which is zero and unless there is a pulse or a change in frequency. And for a pulse, that means that uh, this pulse lasts on the order of nanoseconds. And so we can actually follow the lifetime of that pulse to nanosecond accuracy. So we get a very nice ability to measure what's going on. Uh, it's very, uh, uh, very selective because we can tune the laser. It's high sensitivity. Uh, we can stand off so we don't have to be in the, in the flow itself. It's non-intrusive. And the other thing is that we don't have any background from flame or daylight or other optical interference. So we've been developing this also for standoff technologies. And this just shows for nitric oxide, we can tune the laser onto one of the absorption peaks of nitric oxide, turn it up. This shows what we get as a signal, so it lasts for in the order of a couple of, uh, a few, this is about uh, 200 um, nanoseconds here, so this is in microseconds, and this is in nitrogen. Uh, so we can, we can measure one part per million in nitrogen, and this shows the kind of linearity we get for measuring nitric oxide. So we can use that to measure nitric oxide concentrations uh, this was done by my student, uh, James Michael, and uh, what he did was uh, he, he looked at the nitric oxide coming out through a small hole in this chamber, so it was after the, uh, the flame and in the product gases, and then used that to measure the nitric oxide, and got a, sort of a troubling result, and that is that the nitric oxide concentration went up quite significantly with, uh, with microwave power. Uh, and so we need to go back and understand whether we've figured out how to reduce nitric oxide or not. So this is an interesting challenge. We learned how to make it. We learned how, we learned how to make it. <laughs> well, it, it's, it's actually pretty much what we'd expect if we looked at the uh, increase of nitric oxide with temperature. This is, this is the increase of nitric oxide over what you get with a 0.8 equivalence ratio of flame. And by increasing the temperature by about 100 Kelvin, you go up by about a factor of three. So we saw about a factor, factor of three increase. So we'd like to have less than that, and uh, so we're going to be looking at that to see if we can minimize the nitric oxide. All right, so I'm going to go very quickly through some control of high-speed flows and then, and then end on, this, uh, uh, on my femtosecond thing. So we're trying to figure out how do we uh, control high-speed flows. Uh, we're really focusing on hypersonics. These are a variety of the things we're looking at. Let me just talk about drag reduction and then uh, suppression of separation, and I'll do this relatively quickly. This, this is a, a bit of a noisy slide, so I, I apologize for that. Uh, and uh, let me try this. Okay, so what we did to, sub, to separation, as many of you may know, a shock wave interacts with a, with a boundary layer, and it causes a separation bubble where there's backward flow. So there's reverse flow in here. The, shock, the motion of the air is from left to right. Uh, and what we do is we put down here on the surface a little, a, a pair of electrodes which are embedded in the surface. And this shows this pair of electrodes. And then what we, we put a voltage across there and get a spark. And that spark then moves downstream, if I can go backwards here. So you can see that spark moves downstream with the flow. But if we put it in a magnetic field, we can push that spark down. So it's like a snow plow. And that snow plow pushes away this backward circulation and forces it downstream. And so the, the uh, result of that is this shows some acetone imaging, the separation bubble is very clear here. It's not quite so clear in the uh, uh, fluorescence, but when we turn this, turn this on, we end up getting rid of the separation bubble and pushing the, pushing the flow downstream. You can see this is a measure of pressure. With, with the separation, we get a plateau here, which is characteristic of this reverse flow, and then when we turn this on, uh, we can push it downstream. So it's a very uh, attractive way of getting rid of separation. The disadvantage, of course, is that you have to have a high power magnet. Uh, and so we, we're, we're looking at other ways of getting rid of separation. And one of them is to use a dielectric barrier discharge, which is located just upstream. And that, uh, with very short pulses, nanosecond pulses, can create some mixing with the core flow 
and as far as we can tell now is getting rid of separation. So we need to look at that, and we're currently doing research in that area. Okay, so the other thing that uh, we're interested in is this business about trying to, trying to affect drag and also steering of a hypersonic vehicle or hypersonic projectile. Uh, and so we want to put energy in in front of it. And if we put in enough energy, uh, what happens is we reduce the drag uh, uh, more than uh, we would have gotten, we would have, let's see, we have a better efficiency uh, than by increasing the thrust. In other words, if I want to speed this vehicle up, I'm better off at hypersonic speeds of uh, uh, putting energy in in front rather than putting energy into my, my propulsion system. And this is just an indication of how that scales with Mach number and the angle of attack. And so you can see that if I get a relatively high angle of attack, say 10 degrees, by the time I get to Mach 4, this value of 1 corresponds to the trade-off. So anything higher than here, you're better off putting your energy in in front of the vehicle, which is kind of counterintuitive. But it has uh, a great uh, potential. So these are some images that we've taken uh, recently in our Mach 2 wind tunnel. The advantage here is that you can, you can not only reduce the drag, but you can also steer the vehicle. So if I put it in off-center, I can, I can get lift and uh, and we've done measurements, this, or, or, uh, modeling. This is with Gigi Martinelli uh, and Chris Limbach. And this basically tells you know, where you need to put it. So if I want to say the drag here, if I want to reduce the drag, which is blue, I put it in front of the vehicle. Well, that shouldn't be a surprise. Uh, if I want to increase the lift, I, I want to I, I increase the lift here. I put it up here. That reduces the density above this and changes the pressure differential, and I get lift. Now, there's some interesting phenomena that are going here that have to do with what happens with the shock wave. But most of the thing that happens is associated with that heated region. So what we're now looking at is how do we do this in an operational uh, way. And the way we do this is we uh, go back again to remember this femtosecond laser uh, guiding. So we fire a femtosecond laser. We generate a region out in front. And then we fire a high power laser and use that region uh, as the, uh, uh, to, to localize that uh, high power laser energy. And so these are some, some preliminary experiments. This is just the femtosecond laser. These are taken about two microseconds afterwards. And this is what happens when we uh, put, uh, put this first, and then about 60 nanoseconds later, we hit it with a high power. And this is a shock wave, by the way. So you're seeing a shock propagating away from this region. So it provides a very nice way of localizing uh, the energy addition. And uh, we, what we want to do is we want to put it into a line because that turns out to be more effective. OK, so I'm just going to finish up by uh, talking about this femtosecond laser ex uh, electronic excitation tagging because I think it's pretty exciting. Uh, uh, one of the things that we're challenged with is to try to understand what the flow field is doing. How does, how does it evolve in time? And what we found is that using this femtosecond laser, I can dissociate the nitrogen molecules. So I excite them. I break them apart into atoms. Those atoms come back together again. And when they come back together, they emit light. OK, so I'm not going to ask you to recreate this diagram. But for those of you that may recognize a potential energy diagram, this corresponds to the energy of dissociation. So these atoms, when they come back, they come back into an excited state, and they emit light. Uh, we also emit light when we create them. And uh, that gives us prompt emission. This one's delayed because it takes time for these molecules to find each other. And that delay is relatively long time. So here, this is in the order of 15 microseconds. It can last actually much longer than that. And so I'll just show you some pictures here. This is uh, just an air jet. And we take a picture of that with a time-gated camera. You can see that we have uh, now a, a, a quantitative image of what's going on with the velocity. So this is near the exit. This is five diameters downstream, 10 and 15. So I can take these pictures and really see the dynamics of the motion and capture it single shot. And then I can take many shots and get and, and get a time averaged. And uh, if we look at a, uh, at a video of this, this is using pure nitrogen, uh, we can take multiple shots uh, and just watch the evolution of this flow. So this is just a little jet of nitrogen. We can take a look at it. And we can take many of in images and, uh, and, and get quantitative measures of what the velocity is. This also works at uh, supersonic speeds. This, this is an underexpanded supersonic jet. This is what you see you know, coming out the back of the space of the space shuttle, actually, when it was launched. And there's a Mach disk here. So the, this starts off at around Mach 1 and then accelerates to about Mach 4. And then, there's a, then it, behind the Mach disk, you're back subsonic again. 
So we've written this line into the upper part, and you can see what we see here. Coming across down here, we have a relatively uniform flow. This is, this is outside of the flow. This is the, the center lines around here. And then as we come up to the mock disk, you can see that there's a slip line right about here, and I get this discontinuous flow, and then it becomes subsonic behind the mock disk. So I have instantaneous images of what happens with the flow. And then I can use that to determine what the velocity is by looking at that displacement and then uh, and dividing it by the time. So I can get the velocity, which is about 600 meters per second, at this mock disk and then drops down subsonic behind the mock disk. We can also use it to do measurements, and this was done at the uh, uh, Air Force Research Laboratory in uh, Dayton. Of This is a, a pulse detonation uh, engine, and uh, they ignite this thing, fire it, and we write a line. This doesn't really show very well. The line was originally written here, and then we look at a time delay after about one microsecond, and it gives us a measure of the velocity of the pulse detonation engine. We can also use it to measure temperature, and I'll just mention that uh, the, the uh, prompt emission gives us a measure of the temperature by looking at the, at the, at the tails of this, these lines in the ultraviolet. Uh, the rotational modes uh, equilibrate very quickly, and we can look at the tails and determine the temperature and uh, fit those to, to various models and get the temperature that is uh, uh, associated with that flow. And we can do fitting parameters, and then we can do measurements of that temperature. What we see is that there is a certain amount of heating which is occurring due to the tagging process because we've dissociated the molecules. Uh, but once we, this is repeatable, so once we take that into account, then we can do measurements. And this is a measurement, essentially, of temperature uh, across a, a hot jet. So we have an ability to do temperature. We can also uh, then uh, make a line image. And so this gives us a position along the line. This is the spectrum. And so from this spectrum, I can do a measurement of temperature at each point along the line. So there are various nice, nice applications uh, that are uh, available there. OK, so I just want to summarize the characteristics of this femtosecond laser electronic excitation tagging. So you don't have to seed the air. That's one of the advantages. Uh, it operates in air, nitrogen, and other gas mixtures, including nitrogen. We get instantaneous profiles. We don't have to have a probe in there, high resolution. It's simple. It's one laser, one camera. We can write grids and crosses and look at vorticity and uh, shear stress and such things. And we can, we've operated it down to about one tor, so very low pressure and more than one atmosphere, and we've operated over a range of temperatures. And we think we can get temperature profiles, and we're interested in species and densities. But we do get some heating along the line. So let me just summarize. Uh, uh, so we, we have been looking at the control of uh, atmospheric pressure and higher pressure flames using pulse microwave energy. We get high efficiency coupling. We get a small percentage of, at, at a small percentage of flame power. Uh, we get a, a more than 20% speed enhancement. We can extend the lean limit. We can do distributed ignition and then some acoustic control. Uh, we can control high-speed airflows using MHD snowplow arcs, nanosecond pulse di dielectric barrier discharges, uh, and using uh, guided uh, energy Dewey steering and lift control. And then we've been working on the development of these new diagnostics. So with that, this is the answer to your question. <laughs> <laughs>